and it stems from a personal interest in Polynesian lifestyle studies and curriculum. And I'd like to thank the PAA for uh, allowing me to report on this. All the texts are printed on the screen, so I can let you read. I was asked to pronounce things very carefully and in an understandable manner, and I will. Anyway, what's most important here is that when the people moved out from the uh, Southeast Asian coastline, they took with, all, with them all the things that were needed. However, they left out two things, metal and weaving. Weaving is at least 25,000 years old, as we know from the uh, Dolni Vestonitz cave in the Czech Republic. Why did the people leave weaving behind with two or three very minor exceptions, notably in the Caroline Islands and in Vanuatu, remains a mystery. And if there are any students or any researchers who would like to go ahead and study that, I would be very grateful. Yes, Marion? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, absolutely. My apologies, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for the directions. Time was short. No, very, very short. Um, behind the photograph, behind the text, you see modern-day banana fiber weaving, uh, just to show you that uh, the material was actually present at all times. To replace the weaving technique, the people in Oceania invented tapa, which we are all familiar with. And here on the, on the right of the screen, we have a magnificent piece of tapa, a kibuta, which was a poncho from uh, Tahiti. At the top, you have Captain Cook-related tapa specimens, which show that most of them, or actually all of them, are geometric or plain. And on the left, we have a Solomon Island, late 19th century, early 20th century tapa showing dugongs, which are um, painted <coughs> with, sorry about the thunder in my voice, uh, which are painted with indigo, natural indigo. One of the things that is interesting here that we have uh, discovered in doing the research is that the uh, fern designs on the Tahitian tapa do not predate contact with the Western world. They seem to be a contact or slightly post-contact development. And they may lead to, uh, they may be the beginning, the inception of this magnificent wild flowery uh, world that we identify with Polynesia. Here you can see Captain Henry Martin's um, drawings, one of which shows this canoe with people wearing European clothing. Uh, notice a couple of things. First of all, they're wearing very, very full clothing, covering the entire body. The clothing is of European design, and it is extremely colorful. Uh, Captain Martin was a very, very faithful watercolorist. Uh, his representations are quite exact. If we go a little further into his drawings, we discover that uh, the clothing that the people were wearing is geometric. The designs are geometric. They are not the flowery floral prints that we associate with the parade. One of the reasons may be that when the first Europeans were coming out as settlers, they had to bring mattresses. And mattress ticking is usually, or at least was usually, striped. And there's a strong possibility that they did not bring out completed mattresses, because they weigh a lot, they gather a lot of humidity, and they take up a lot of space. And so European settlers were coming out with bolts of cloth, or rolls of cloth. And this cloth subsequently ended up in uh, local consumption. You can read the text here. Uh, the advent of European woven cloth with its bright colors, varying motifs, and availability uh, as early as the 1820s replaced tapa cloth on most of the people in Polynesia, for sure. Melanesia, of course, uh, was clothed at a later date. The technique for creating the pareo. The pareo is a late development. The pareo is a piece of cloth which is approximately two yards, two meters long. It is wrapped around the waist. It can be wrapped around the shoulders as well. And uh, the pareo was printed first by hand printing and
and subsequently by what's called lead plate printing. And these gigantic presses here, as you can see, were producing vast quantities of tapical. We'll come to that in a moment. Here you have a text that shows that Charles Wilkes observed in 1839 already that people were wearing cast off of European clothing, but were also automatically incorporating a pareo. And you'll notice that Peru or pareo is already included in his text. It's not a later invention, the word. Down below we have a printing block with a floral pattern. It's a wood repetitive printing block, much in the style of those used in Southeast Asia. And on the right, there is a, I wouldn't call it a sample book, I would call it a technological description book. It's a manual for printing cloth. And you have in it two samples of polka dots, red and white. As you can see down below, it was claimed that 16, one, one, I'm sorry, 1,600 pieces of 12 yards each were able to be printed in a 10-hour day by four workmen. I did the math. That's 19,200 yards. That's 19 kilometers, basically. We investigated, found, collected, and analyzed several hundred original Pareo, including 19th century production and commercial sample books. We identified production centers and techniques. And by matching the motives in the paintings and drawings with photographs of the 19th and early 20th century, we were able to reconstruct the temporality of certain motifs, which is most important. And we were able to restitute the original colors of the Pareo as seen in photographs and in paintings. We are the new web telescope of the Pareo. We are capable of looking back into time and offering you the real colors that were being used when you look at the 19th century black and white photos. As you can see in this uh, blue spreadsheet here, where the orange arrow points to printed calico, in 1855, 1,061,000 yards were printed and exported. This is a British endeavor. Uh, most of the calico that was sent to the Pacific, regardless if it was in the French domain, the German domain, or the English domain of colonialism, was basically produced by the British. The French, German, and American printing processes and uh, commercial endeavors were developed much later. In 1855, Britain exported 1,196,000 meters. That's 1,196 kilometers of printed calico cloth in one year. And of which 970 kilometers are calico. Okay, so they are Pareo material. Here you have another blue spreadsheet showing the uh, inventory of the lead print books. Now these lead print books, unfortunately, we have found the originals. They are in the National Museums of Scotland. Uh, unfortunately, somebody tried to reorganize them a couple of decades ago. And the person who did it did not realize that there are parallel series of inventory numbers. So Philip Sykes has gone back and has tried to reconstruct the actual inventory of all of these lead sheets. But um, we actually have the, the physical sheets as well in many cases. Here you have two sample books uh, showing the true colors of 19th century Pareo material. And here we have a very, very interesting situation. On the left, slightly out of focus, in the dark, you have a section of the photograph of the young woman in the middle of the early photo down below. Now this photograph is either the Solomon Islands or Vanuatu. We have not yet been able to actually define it. This is a Melanesian area photograph. Uh, the photograph was taken in the late 19th century, possibly the extreme beginning of the 20th. This young lady is wearing a pareo on the left, and here you can see I have pinpointed the design element of four silhouettes with things in the middle, 
which happened to be these four silhouettes with a selection of clubs, bowls, and ads, possibly bags, from Fiji. And this Pareo material, two color, gray and uh, blue, is actually the representation of a whole series of Fijian motifs, which I find very interesting that already at the late 19th century, and it's very, it's very, very um, accurate as well, the illustration. So they're probably being taken from early engravings. As a matter of fact, the portraits uh, which are represented here are taken from early photographs. And you can see how precise the drawings are. This is an interesting case. On the left, you have the photograph of the two young men by Paul Millot in 1870. We were able to find a true section of the Pareo material that the young man on the right is wearing. However, we also discovered something very interesting, that um, while used on this young man in 1870, J.F. Hutton & Co. re-edited the pattern for sale in Africa. And it appears that to do so, he didn't have the original plates. He recreated the plates from the photograph of Mio so that the original designs are a little bit smaller and ever so slightly a little bit out of focus. This is a very interesting situation. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty of space travel, time travel. This is a photograph from 1896, discovered by Daniel Blau. And uh, Gauguin is in the left, all right? He's right there leaning over a young couple who are very tenderly enlaced on the grass. The fact that this is Gauguin is not that important in this case. However, it's the date, and it is the fact that the man who is actually, sorry, the man who is lying here, this man with this face, is lying here, and you can see the rest of his body here at Pareo. That's the original color. And if we go a little further, we have this man who's over there smoking a cigarette. Oh, and that's the original color. Some are red and yellow, some are red and white, some are in negative. You basically have three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue and of course using white as the background. One of the lovely things we discovered is this fabulous painting, Mano Tupapao from 1892 by Paul Gauguin. He changed the colors. Here is the true color of the pareo that the young woman is lying on. Oh. Better yet, here is a photograph taken at the same time as the Gauguin photo we saw before by Jules Agostini with one of the men who is a friend of Agostini's and who is connected to Gauguin wearing that same pareo. And also you'll notice that he's wearing a shirt over it, which is a very, very typical Tahitian manner of uh, clothing in the colonial time. Here we have Jack London and Charmaine Kittredge on the Smart in 1907. Magnificent photo. Unfortunately, this is one instance where we have not been able to figure out where are the originals of these two pareos. Yes. But they're absolutely astounding, especially the one she is wearing, which appears to be extremely uh, late 19th century, early 20th Art Nouveau kind of removing from uh, arts and crafts period. And to the right, you have a young Tahitian woman in traditional attire. The photograph is uh, named Tahi. I don't know if it's her name or a misspelling of Tahiti. This photograph appears in an album called Fair Tahiti by Paul Gooding in 1905. And one of the interesting things I find here is that she's standing in the background. She's standing with a background of Polynesian uh, foliage, which is amazingly identical to what the designs are on what she's wearing. So it would appear that the British, the French and the German designers were also basing their designs on early photographs that showed 
Polynesian foliage. Here we have the painter Joseph Dwight Strong, who is the son-in-law of Robert Louis Stevenson, standing with the family. Robert is in the middle. Uh, and he is wearing this red and white pareo around 1890. You can read the text at the top. All I have to do is say thank you. This is uh, a book that is coming out, we hope, to see the light in 2024, maybe 2023 at the end of it, but I think 2024. If you have any information, if you would like to share something with us, be very, very grateful. Thank you so much for your attention.